Hey, before we roll into this next episode, I want to thank all of you that have left a review on iTunes. This helps with my rankings and helps me keep this podcast free. I also want to talk about one of my sponsors. We get a lot of questions about spot and stalk hunts. And one of the things that's really helped out my game, has really been a game changer actually, is I started wearing sneak tech boots a couple of years ago. And they've really taken my my stalks to the next level of sneak. So if you want to amp up your game and really improve your success in the field, check out Sneak Tech as S-N-E-E-K-T-E-C dot com and check out the Sneak Boot. Hi, and welcome to the interviews with the Hunting Masters brought to you by the OutdoorInsiders.com, your number one spot for insider information and quality gear. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, hunting black bear. And I uh, I grabbed two guys that I know are just uh, black bear slaying machines. And you probably recognize this guy's ugly mug right in front of me here. It's... Uh, Scott Scott Haugen from uh, The Hunt, and uh, who you can't see in the background because uh, his internet sucks, is uh, Perry Kremens. <laughs> How you guys doing? Doing good, thanks. <laughs> we're yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> um, why don't you give us uh, Scott? Why don't you give us a little You'll see round me next about time. yourself? <laughs> we'll see you next time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I've been fortunate to, gosh, this is my 17th year of uh, being able to make a living in the outdoors. I uh, have uh, started off as an outdoor writer actually 20 years ago. And after about uh, three years of trying that, I thought, you know, I could make a living at this outdoor writing stuff. So my wife and I had taught in, in uh, school in, in Arctic, Alaska. We were school teachers before this, but getting into this business full time and, and had just finished up four years of teaching uh, overseas at an international school in Indonesia and had traveled around, hunted and fished my whole life, ran a big trap line, a 200 mile wolf trap line up in Alaska and hunted and fished yeah. everywhere. And yeah, you know, so I was I always had my hands in it and, and, uh, I got into the industry. It was just kind of an interesting deal, but it was basically through writing that kind of got me in TV, and and uh, one thing led to another, and we're fortunate to uh, juggle a lot of balls and be able to make a blessed living at this, whether it's writing magazine articles or books or speaking or uh, you know working pro staff events. Uh, hunting and fishing is what we get to do uh, year-round. It's great because there's always a learning experience. I, I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm not an expert. Uh, I learn from a lot of people, but it's really fun for me to get out there and kind of share the teaching elements of, of what I learned and hopefully educate, motivate more people to get out there and do what, what we all love to do. Awesome. And the infamous uh, Perry Kremens, why don't you give us a little rundown about yourself? Oh, do we lose him? Uh, well, oh. I'm not quite uh, I, I stuff, right? So, but, uh, you know, some years of hunting and uh, seems to be going well for that and one like scott said no one claims to be an expert and uh when fooled yeah, perry we're catching every other word um i'm wondering so oh. oh. i'm wondering if you can't find a better spot in the house or something that's a little bit better thing <laughs> yeah, actually let me try something here You're in California, isn't there like a? Song? I know, right? There's like a tower, like on every corner. Oh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> Not a little better. A little bit. It's still kind of like sounds echoey and stuff. I'm not sure what's going on, but. Uh, I, what I did is it had a little thing here that says low bandwidth. Use low bandwidth, with, but. Yeah, that sounds um, way better. All right. Maybe it's yeah. It's it's. I'm not at home, so don't think that my home's jacked up. I'm actually at work, and don't let anybody kid you that AT and T has fast uh, bandwidth because they don't. <laughs> well, whatever you did, you sound a lot better now. So, all right, go ahead and give us your wow. give us your uh, intro again because uh, we none of us caught that. Oh, that might be a good thing, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, 
we've been on with you before, John, and uh, you know we we uh, we we're not making a living as well as Scott is. He's Scott's uh, actually one of the few that is uh, capable of that in the outdoor industry, and you know, and uh, good for him for sure. But uh, but we uh, we do a lot of hunting. Running California and, and working in the outdoor industry for Mossy Oak, as well as running an outfitting business. You know, I get the opportunity to hunt quite a few places, and uh, California is just uh, silly with with black bears. So that's how we get into this equation for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, without further ado, we're going to roll into some of these questions I got for you because I've uh, been getting a lot of them because obviously it's season. Uh, a lot of guys getting out there for spring hunts and uh, we'll roll into those fall hunts here pretty pretty soon. You know, it's it's knocking on the door already. Um, so, uh, Scott, what's your uh, preferred method of hunting black bear? You know, it... it I, I like hunting them throughout the entire spring because the tactics kind of change with the bears and their behavior. If I had one way to hunt them, it would probably be the last three or four days of the season by way of calling. And, uh, mm -hmm. just, you know, anytime you can call in an animal, we just wrapped up our turkey season, you know, called in three birds this year. You know, of course, calling elk are great, rattling in, uh, you know, deer are, are awesome too. But calling in a bear, you know, you're, you're a predator and you're out there trying to call those things in. And, you know, most predator calling, uh, uh, coyote, bobcat, you know, they're coming in to, to, to inspect the, the prey and kill it. And right. with a bear, right same thing but they have the ability to kill so it's uh yeah it just takes it to a different level and, you know when you combine what's going on with the bears behaviorally uh, you know with the rut that's going on and and the amount of increased movement of boars during this uh, last week of may before the peak of the rut you know really hits in early june it's it's a really good recipe for getting out there and calling and, and making things happen that's actually my preferred. I love calling Blair, uh, black bears, and I'm, my, the last two that I killed, uh, I, I I did it that way. Uh, I've I've hunted bait too. That's I mean that's always fun, but it's uh, you know always interested to sit there and wait and see what's going to happen. Uh, what about you, Perry? What do you like to do? Well, our our, our kind of preferred method is chosen for us in California, and Scott's under the same thing with when they took our hounds away because. Uh, really, truthfully, the, I, I enjoy hound hunting, and, and that was indeed my favorite method and probably the best method for uh, not only, you know, successful harvest of bears, but being able to, uh, you know, conserve and take the, the bear that you wanted. But, you know, unfortunately, we're uh, like everywhere else in the West, they're taking the hounds away. So mm. spot and stock is really the, the method to use here in California with, uh, you know, the little bit of calling that you can do. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but unlike uh, Oregon and some of the other states, California hasn't yet established a spring season. But uh, with that spring season, that's when your calling works the best. But you know, bears are uh, they're such a, a curious animal. Even in the fall, that works. But once again, my preferred method, only because it was kind of dealt to us here in California, is spot and stock. And, you know, it's really pretty lucrative if you want to shoot a black bear in California to, to use that method. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's kind of uh, the case with most of the Western states. Um, plus, not everybody's got dogs or, or, or the money to be able to go out with an outfitter. So let's, let's dig into the uh, spot and stalk. Um, obviously to do that kind of method, you have to do some scouting. You have to figure out some area where there's some bear at. So uh, Scott, what do you, what are some of the things you, you, uh, you do, you know, regarding scouting and finding good bear territory, good bear, bear areas? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. For me, it comes pretty much down to the science and behavior of bears and, and, and pretty much with boars, especially in the spring, everything revolves around their, their diet. They have a terrible digestive tract, uh, or digestive system, one of the shortest digestive tracts of any any mammal. Uh, so they pass food very fast. Uh, and for me, that's that's the best clue is finding their droppings because mm -hmm. if I can find their droppings and, and see what they're eating, um, it, which is a lot of it is largely undigested, then that tells me right there, okay, these are the food sources I need to concentrate on. Uh, you know, you'll find some different berries this time of year, even early in the spring from berries that aren't going to be ripe until July. Uh, right. They're, they're going 
and some of those off the, you know, off the stems and they're in their scat. Uh, clover, dandelions, uh, grass, of course, is a big one this time of year. Any types of tubers, uh, different types of wildflowers, wild onions, uh, things like that where, uh, um, you, you know, where, where they're out feeding and passing this through their system. You know, you look at a, a bear in the fall where they're eating a lot of different berries and then the berries, the tissues themselves aren't even broken. I mean, you could pretty much wash those off, put them in uh, the camp pancakes and no one know it, would know it if they're eating. <laughs> So the, the, the point is, for me, it's uh, the number one thing I look for is scat, and the number two thing that I look for um, are, are tracks to see if the, if the tracks are fresh. And, and once I establish, you know, based on the area that I'm hunting, where this sign is at, then that's going to tell me where I'm going to concentrate my hunting efforts. Well, it makes sense. Now, leading up to that, like, what do you do to pick that spot before you got boots on the ground to even go look to see if there's bear sign? Like what are some of the things you look for, like on a topo or aerial or something like that? Kind of yep. narrow down. Yeah. Good point. So a starting point, I guess, to get you into that area. Um, I'm going to be looking for South facing slopes. I really like, a, um, I like high elevation and I like low elevation, depending on the train that I'm hunting in. Now I was hunting bears, uh, Gosh, less than a week ago, we're at about 5,000 feet elevation. It was 29 degrees. So it wasn't really a, a conducive spot for finding many bears moving. That's a pretty late spring in this area. Uh, then again, I had them on the coast range where, you know, it's been 60 degrees for, you know, a couple of weeks. And, and some of those bears are down in lower elevations in some of the creek bottoms. So what I really like finding, and we've had a very wet spring throughout the West of this year, um, ideally, traditionally, what I find, I like the south-facing slopes. I like rocky ledges, uh, big rocky outcroppings where the runoff is high. And then a lot of that runoff is going to, you know, obviously collect below those those rocks. And that's where a lot of these bears are going to first start, you know, digging for tubers, eating grass, whatever it is. So generally speaking, uh, that, that's what I like. Uh, you're going to get green up the, uh, lower elevations as well if you're hunting valleys or the coast range, uh, where, where a lot of the food sources are going to start greening up quicker in creek bottoms the thing about creek bottoms where i hunt is it's very very brushy and okay. you know you hear all these studies about bears around the west and how many you know bears are in a state bears are very very difficult to get a, a census count on and a lot of that has to do with brushy terrain so so where i really start my hunt really depends on what what type of country i'm hunting in okay Barry, are you still with us oh man I Hey, I love listening to Scott. I mean, I, I do too. I, I just making Scott sure I heard. I heard a little he ding said, before. I heard a little ding before. I thought maybe yeah, that was. That was uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't uh, sure wasn't, that was you dropping off or something. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But just uh, you know, it's great listening to Scott, a scientist of the species man it's uh not many people know that much about biological about critter i'm kind of a you know in california now i'm i'm kind of sad that i don't have my spring bear tag uh in oregon this year uh, you know they're talking about going up into those high grinding those bears and spot and stalking them in, in the spring seriously here in cal it's just so it's silly how many bears we have Mm -hmm. Really, any alpine uh, basin in any of our Cascade wildernesses, or even some of the eastern wilderness, and you're going to you're going to find a bear. Uh, you're going to be able to glass them up. We we uh, I had a couple folks down from Oregon last year on a, a blacktail hunt early in the season, and the last week of August we hunted blacktail deer, and in in one week of hunting we saw 17 bears while we were wow. hunting deer. Crazy and. Uh, and everyone in a position that you could have spot and stock with bow and arrow for sure. Yeah. So I, I, I imagine it's kind of like hunting here in Arizona and uh, in some of the high desert areas uh, and and the, the real glassable stuff. You're just looking for a point where you can see a lot of country and just uh, let your eyes do the walking and, uh, and, and just try to pick them up. Um, you know, while they're still out feeding, uh, we have some advantages when the prickly pears come in. Um, usually that's the fall hunt. Um, you know, if you find big patches of prickly pear, uh, lot, you know, anything that they're really going to, uh, love feeding on, you know, that's a, that's like a treat for them. They're going to be in that, you know? So, but, um, yeah, our, 
bears here really uh you know early they get the 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 fawn crop and then they go into the manzanita berries and just kill them so if you find those patches but you know mm-hmm. but another good way is if uh you know if you're hunting the low country you just find some water because they're going to get they're going to be on that water every evening and oh, every yeah. morning probably every everything in arizona is about water so that's a given you you can start with water with any species <laughs> you know so um well so let's talk about baiting a little bit there's still plenty of states that allow it um i did a little bit of it myself back east um when we were allowed to do it back then and uh you know since i've been out here i haven't really done it i've gone on some baited hunts in canada um but you know i know the basics and stuff but what what are you know describe to me well for one do you do any baiting or have you done any baiting before i even ask the question honestly in california we haven't we don't we don't it's not allowed right but uh but i think i think it was in washington right and and uh, Oregon parts of Washington parts of Washington uh uh it is right now it's pretty it's pretty restricted it it's uh okay. been legal in years um, okay. I've done a lot of, oh, um I've done quite a bit in Alaska um in gosh three different provinces up in up in Canada um it it's something that 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 I love that I wish every state would adopt and and perry touched on this earlier with the hound hunting you know it's funny we're fortunate you know to raise the kids hunting and you know our youngest one who's uh, a a freshman in high school someone asked him the other day they said well so what's the favorite hunt you've been on and he's been on a lot of cool hunts and he said it's probably the hound hunt for bears and we took him on that hunt uh fall before last in, in idaho and Perry had mentioned how effective hound hunting is for bear, and I feel baiting is the same way. You know, nowhere you get to to watch a bear for so long usually, and, and really size up that animal and selectively, you know, take the animal you want. You know, it's not like a a quick spot and stop thing or a, or a calling, um, you know, scenario where you might be shooting a bear as it's you know running at you full speed or something like that. Mm-hmm. You get and I'm working on a bear book, and my friends laugh at because I've been working on a bear book for about seven years, and and I'd like to I'd like to finish it one of these days, but I just keep learning too much about these bears, and what I learn a lot about the behavior takes place on some of these bait piles, and, and I love it. You know, you watch a big boar come in, and and, and it's it's crazy how how smart they can be. Um, you, you know, we're, we literally they're so cagey you can't get a shot at them with a rifle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the next thing go in and have six or seven bears, you know, laying under your stand. Uh, I've had them, you know, playing with my pull rope of, of my bow, you know, under the right. stand, hitting it. <laughs> and, uh, fall up the tree, you know, where I've had to pull them with uh, you know, my broad head through the rungs of my, uh, you know, of, of, of my stand or pour coffee on them. Or, uh, you, you know, you shoot a bear and it dies there right at dark and you have six other bears around you. You know, now what? Yeah. Type of thing. So, so I love bear bear baiting, and if you think about it from a from a scientific approach of being able to manage bears and, and take bears out of an area, and that's in Oregon now, you can kill five <laughs> summer over the summer on a draw. But there are a lot of people that you know that that have five tags every year, and they're looking to fill them. And, and it comes back to the population density of a bear of bears in an area. It, it's you know, talk to hunters that are out there year round, how many bears they see in the wild. One of my favorite places to hunt in Idaho, uh, I, I don't think I've ever not killed a bear there for the last 10 years uh, mm-hmm. that I've hunted there. Um, not once have I seen a bear on the beautiful grassy hillside, you know, digging up gra- uh, tubers, eating grass, eating roots. But you set a bear uh, bait in the timber and, and you're getting new bears showing up every day, you know, for six right. weeks at a time. Right. Bear densities are incredibly high, so so I love baiting bear, and that yeah. and that that whole that whole technique of baiting in itself, as far as baits and setting baits at certain times, and what types of bait to use. That uh, oh, holy cow, that's a science in itself. Yeah. Um. Well, without going into a big tirade about it, like, give us a <laughs> give us a you know a, a shortened uh, version of you know some do's and don'ts. With with the bears, you know, I, I like sweets. Um, I like I like uh, 
oils, you know, greases, cooking oils, ba uh, bacon grease, you know, animal fat, uh, mm -hmm. anything like that. Is I, re I really like anise oil scent. It's that licorice uh, oh, yeah. smell. I don't don't know what it is um bears love it uh I, it was my number one set when i was trapping growing up here in oregon for coyotes and bobcats and beaver i used it on my trap line in alaska and you know trapped wolves in 60 below temperatures with it it's it's in my favorite in ingredient for curing eggs for salmon so i don't know what it is about the anise oil but it's a it's a scent that, that turns all types of animals on i love that for bears some of the higher country where you know where you're back packing in there and, and you know camping uh a, a, you know with, with a camp on your back type deal you know you're not going to be carrying in 50 pounds of you know cookie dough or or donuts right. from the donut right. in those in those situations i've taken in um you know like butter and then just just popcorn and i'll pop popcorn uh in some of those areas it's light it takes the bears quite a while to get through it you know pour butter or grease over them and, and that can be really good as well yeah it's good for you too if you get a little hungry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, smell. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think don't have to worry about. Don't, you don't have to worry about me hitting your bait if it has that uh, anus oil in it. Why it's you pronouncing it anus oil? That's it. That's not what it is. That does not sound no. good. It's a niece. It's a <laughs> no. niece. It's called a niece. A niece oil or it's oil. licorice. It is. It's, it's really I know. Bad. It's Sambuca. Yeah. <laughs> it's Sambuca yeah. and Uzo. <laughs> yeah. But in another yeah, my wife. The baby. Oh, his wife's a health nut too. <laughs> Don't not be around her to eat that black licorice. Oh, yeah, not good. Well, we'll have a boys night out. We'll uh, we'll check it out. Another thing about the baiting, I think, is establishing bait times where you get these bears where they're not where, where they're not nocturnal. We've had areas where we've been targeting, you know, big, big bears trying to, to get a big old wise boar, you know, 12, 15, right. 20 years old. And, you know, if they're only coming in for 10 minutes in the dark, we've gone to the extent where we're packing baits in in the afternoon, sitting there, you know, up until dark and then packing that bait back out with us. So, so right. trying to get those in the daylight. So there, there's a big, there's a big science be between it, you know, the, the, uh, between trying to connect the dots here. These, these big old bears are wise. Yeah. It's, it's funny you were mentioning Idaho. So one of the last bears I shot uh, over bait or wasn't really, I guess I wouldn't technically call it bait, but um, what it was in Idaho and what the guy, uh, the friend of mine that I was doing, um, he was taking uh, like bacon grease and now that I think about it, I think it might have been anise. And he was putting it in a can and and lighting it on fire and like running it like a candle basically and then putting green boughs on top of it so it'd smoke. And that smoke, you know, it smelled really good. And that's what it was bringing the bears in. And I shot a pretty decent color vase bear off of that little concoction. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, doing the bear burns is highly effective, especially if you have a good wind moving, um, you know, in, into these draws where these bears might be bedded down. Uh, right. I, I love doing right. burns. A lot of times I'll just use cooking oil for that or old, you know, uh, cooking grease. Uh, like you say, just get a fire going, put the green boughs on it, and it'll burn for a couple uh, hours there. We were filming a TV show one time in, in Idaho and started a burn, crawled up into the stand. My cameraman was ahead of me getting in the stand up above me. I wasn't even my, in my stand yet, and he says, look at the bait. And there's a really nice cinnamon bear on the <laughs> bait, standing right next to the flame. It's like, holy cow, we've got to kill that bear before he catches on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Well, uh, let's go back to spot and stalk since that's uh, what most of the guys are doing nowadays. Um, and then I kind of want to get into to calling a little bit and I want to hear your take on it. And then I'm going to give you mine because I've had some pretty good success calling and uh, just calling in animals, period. So I've kind of applied the same um, principles to all of it. Um, you know, so... You know what kind of areas you key into when you're going to a spot and stalk? If you, like you had mentioned, like you went to Idaho and you don't really ever see anything out in the green fields and stuff. So if you have to apply a, a spot and stalk to a 
to an area where the bears are in thicker stuff, what are you, what are you kind of doing to put the odds in your favor, so to speak? So, you know, for that area like Idaho, if I was going to go hunt that area by, by way of spot and stock, I'd just basically hunt it like I, like how I'd hunt deer or elk. I'd get in these wooded draws and, and, you know, try to catch these, these bears out feeding. They don't have to leave this, you know, heavily shaded, big, big timber. All the food and water they need is right there. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, some of the areas in, in, in Western Oregon, uh, say where I might be hunting or, or, you know, even parts of Wyoming or, or Montana where we might be hunting in some of those areas where, where, you know, these bears are moving quite a bit more to get, to get different food sources. So it, again, with bear, it just always comes down to the food source. What food is available in that area during that specific time? And, uh, it, you know, are, are, are they, is the population of bears localized enough, um, you know, where you can go just hunt one spot and look for bears or do you have to cover a lot of ground or wait till later in the year, you know, for these boars to start moving, uh, covering ground and hopefully catching them, you know, eating as, as they go. Uh, some of the thicker habitat, like I say, I'll get down to lower, lower elevations and, and spend quite a bit of time moving slowly and glassing. That's where I'm really going to, you know, once I pick an area to hunt as I'm hunting, that's where I'm really looking for the droppings and I'm looking for tracks. You know, if I'm in there two hours and don't find a single dropping or track, then, then I'm out of there. I'm going somewhere right. else. Right. Right. Now, uh, Perry, you're uh, you're primarily uh, going to that traditional spot and stalk. You're looking for a you know big expansive area. You're getting in there, setting up on a high point or or a low point, looking up into the ridges. Um, that's what I get. I gather from what you were saying earlier. Is that my correct? The thing about um, California is, uh, you know, it's the bear population is. It's just so out of hand that you don't have to worry about finding a bear. I mean, obviously, you know, bears are all about groceries, so mm-hmm. they're going to be at a food source. But if you get at some elevation above 3,000 feet or 4,000 feet up in the wilderness uh, or some of the open alpine terrain, I mean, you're going to find bears every day, uh, not only by footprint, but just by sight. And right. there's, there's so much so much food up there. Uh, you know, they start targeting uh, the fawns here in about probably two or three weeks. Uh, but, you know, a year like this year where we, you know, it'll be end of June before you can get up to some over the 6,000 foot passes with all the snow. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's just uh, the spot in stock. It's it's not like you're going to have to really search for a place to find bears. You're just going to search for a place that you want to hunt and is going to cater it. to what kind of hunt you want. Now, now, is that an over-the-counter tag or is that a draw tag in California? No, no, it's a over-the-counter. But the silly thing is, and I never could figure this out, is you know they have a uh, quota for bears. Once they hit 1,800 bears in California, they shut the season off. Okay, uh, since, like Arizona. Since, yeah, but since they eliminated hound hunting, they've not yet hit that uh, that quota oh, wow. um, in, on any year. And then the silliest thing they did uh, is they limited the number of tags that you can that can be sold. So it okay. never made sense to me to limit the number of tags if you have a quota. Yeah, if they need to sense. generate some revenue. I mean, we're if they're not meeting the quota, get some more folks out there to shoot these bears. We have right? so many. Sell bears some more there. tags, make some more money. I mean, yeah. come on. Yeah. Right, that's... Scott will be, Scott will back this up. There's just not a ton of people that bear hunt. Uh, you know, there's guys that like bear hunting and there's guys that just, they can take it or leave it. Um, but, but really it's, it's, uh, some pretty fun and it's successful. Uh, the only issue we run into in the, some of the wilderness stuff is, you know, it's the bear season for bow and arrow is August and first part of September. It's pretty warm. Right. Uh, You better figure out how you're going to get that bear, you know, cut up and get out of that wilderness before it spoils. And 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 so there's no spring season at all. It's just a fall over the counter, right? Yeah. Nope. Just a fall. You get the bow and arrow hunt for about uh, four weeks. Then there's a, a one week break. And then the, uh, the general bear season starts the third week of September and runs all the way through the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. I saw quite a bit of bear sign hunting blacktail, uh, last, last two years, uh, up there in Mendocino Valley 
or Mendocino area. Um, and I glassed up one bear uh, in the Manzanitas um, last year as well. I, I, could, I could tell it was a really bear. And, and it's not real what you would consider bear country, I think. It's because it's still, you know, like oak oak trees and, you know, big yellow grass flats and we're not really flats, but, uh, you know, yellow Hills, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I might have to and give that Savannah, a go. I might have to give that a go if it's over yeah, the counter. Oak Savannah is pretty good, though. The low country oaks. Um, we have so many bears here in California. These, the mature bears are actually getting, uh, the older bears get outcast from the high country because the younger bears are a little more athletic and okay. taking over their terrain. So the the bigger bears find the easy life down low and and wander around in the oaks and and uh, apple orchards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, calling and stuff. What's uh, give me a perfect scenario, Scott? What do you what do you if you see a bear on the hillside? Or, or do you blind call? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think the perfect scenario for a bear is seeing a bear, you know, locating a bear first, sizing it up. You know, it, 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 I pretty much relegated myself to, you know, unless we need the meat, which we, we'll, gosh, we, we used to get three or four bears a year in our family. It's my favorite eating big game meat. I'll take it over deer and elk any day. Oh, so, yeah, so we're killing yeah. Um, but, you know, as I get into looking for bigger bears, you know, and, and I have kind of a, a little little sequence that I look for to size up a bear, whether or not it's, you know, I think it's a big bear. Um, so once that's been determined, I like seeing a bear before I start calling. And the reason for that is I've seen bears do so many different things when you're calling. I mean, sometimes you let out a call and I mean, it's, you know, ears down, hair is up and they're, I mean, zero to 35 and five seconds running right at you. You know, mm -hmm. other times lift the ears up and, you know, they'll take a step or two towards you and then they'll start feeding or, you know, get halfway there and seem fairly aggressive and, and then just quit coming. And, and so for me, being able to watch how a bear is behaving in my calls um, is a huge advantage. Um, then again, where I do a lot of hunting on the coast here in Alaska, um, you know, that's where it comes back to finding the scat and the tracks. If I'm in a thick habitat, uh, mm -hmm. you know, even if I'm spotting stock hunting, if I'm finding fresh sign but not seeing bears, those are perfect uh, places to set up and call. Right. Yeah, I um, I met Wayne Carlton probably about, I don't know, 10 years plus now ago. And he took the time and spent about an hour and a half with me and he was telling me about, you know, how he calls bears and stuff like that. And, and, uh, the first thing he said to me, cause I, my first experiences were, were just blind calling and they worked. I would, my first two bear I ever shot, uh, with calls was, was a uh, wow. blind call, just going into areas, looking for fresh scat and finding like a really hot, you know, pile of poop or something and be like, okay, sit here, basically set up a spot and call. And two times it worked for me. Um, I actually got a video of one of them on my YouTube, if anybody wants to check that out. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, then I, I, I kind of started going, going to the, uh, you know, spot and stalk method and then incorporating calling. And, and I, I think, well, obviously, if you find a bear, your chances, <laughs> your chances of getting a bear are, easy, are better than just yeah, blindly calling. But, <laughs> but I, I found that, um, that it works really, really, really well. I, I've never had one come flying, charging in, like you said, with the ears back and everything. They, they've all been kind of moziers, take their sweet ass time, <laughs> you know, coming across the hill or whatever, but they all, they've all come in, um, you know, one way or another. And, and I, and I, a couple of things that I noticed that it, if you stop calling just for even like a minute, they'll turn around and start walking back the other way. It's like, you got to constantly, 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 constantly call until they actually get there. Um, so what, it, what's, uh, you'll be calling, you know, calling and you don't have no idea the bears on the way. And, uh, uh, shows up, you know, at yards, whatever. 
and uh, using how it's just like a, come in and not not even make a peep. Yeah, it's crazy how uh, ninja like they are for being such big animals. You know, and you yeah. see that a lot on on bear baits. You'll be, you'll be sitting there, you know, daydreaming, looking off into the woods, looking around, and all of a sudden there's a bear underneath your stand. You're like, holy crap, where the hell did that thing come from? <laughs> yeah, they're they're surprising. I mean, they're predators. They know how to be sneaky. They know how to, you know, those big fat pads on their on their uh, paws are very, uh, you know, good. The original sneaky feet, you know. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're a neat animal. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned the, the nonstop calling, and I really think that's the, the key. And that's something, you know, you mentioned Wayne Carlton, uh, Larry Jones up in our neck of the woods shared some things oh, yeah. with me probably 30 years ago, some tips. And, and you know, that's what he said. He said, don't, you know, don't give up calling. And, of course, electronic calls weren't even invented really back then. Mm-hmm. And so you'd, you wake up after a half hour of nonstop calling. I mean, you're <laughs> pass, passed out. You're just, you're just deflated. So now, you know, right. in places where – well, these electronic calls are great. And, and so when I go into call, I'm, I pretty much relegate myself to know that I'm going to be there at least 45 minutes, usually about an hour. Right. Like, you know, called in two or three bears at a set like that, or we might go 20 sets before you call in a bear. It depends where yep. you're hunting. Yep. Now, I found the bears in drier habitats, drier climates respond for some reason better than, than bears in, in wetter, you know, coastal habitats. Uh, I've found that when it comes back to where we talked earlier, being able to see a bear and see how he's reacting to a call, I might start off with a fond distress call. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's got the bear moving for 100 yards. Now he's off doing something else. I can turn up the volume of that, of that thing. Uh, and he's not going to pay any attention. But now, if I uh, switch to a kid distra- a kid goat distress call, or or you know a jackrabbit call, or a woodpecker distress call, now all of a sudden we've got we've got his attention back again. Right. One right. thing I've noticed with a lot of these bears is they seem very ADD in what's going on. It's like if there's an opportunity, you know, they're gonna they're gonna go. A lot of them really. Um, don't maintain a focus for a very long time frame. So if you're set up where you can see a bear and change out those the, that call uh, during the course of the sequence, a lot of times you can get those bears back. You mentioned your situation of, of not having the bear come in aggressively. Mm-hmm. We've had that happen at, you know, where a bear will come in, then it hangs up. And it's like, gosh, he's 70 yards out. You know, we want to get him, you know, 20 yards to kill him with a bow. So how do you do that? And it's for me, it's just been persistence with changing up calls and okay. and getting that a little closer. So that's that, I, I think you're spot on with your observation. It's neat that you've had the opportunity to to call in your first two bears. That's pretty darn cool. Yeah, yeah. I was. I remember the first time my first one came in. My cameraman tapped me on the shoulder. He's like. <laughs> He came from the backside, and I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, I um, I noticed a couple other things too. Like uh, you mentioned, fawn in the stress. I've only had luck with the fawn in the stress, like during fawning periods, like really early, early, early in the season. Uh, later in the season, I feel like the higher pitch the sound the more crazy, the more aggressive they came in. Like if it was a super high screechy, like almost like they couldn't stand the sound and they just got to go kill this damn thing to shut it up, you know? Yeah, like the nails on the chalkboard thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I've found too. And, and, you know, a lot of people say if you had one call to call in a bear, what would it be? And it's probably going to be a bird distress call. Yeah. That's why I think it's the most – you ever watch Dumb and Dumber where he said, "Hey Harry, what's the most annoying sound in the world?" And he, you know, yeah, goes, yeah, it's yeah. like that. Yeah. Bears just seem to love that. Yeah, I I don't remember what uh, what it's called specifically. It's a rabbit call. I have it. It's I, I want to say it's like a a baby cottontail or something of that, but it's super high pitched and it's super annoying to listen to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Th- those first two bears were on that call, and I had oh, been trying really? before that. Yeah, I had tried other things. I tried fawn in distress. I tried, I tried uh, black tailed doe. I had, um, you know, I was just kept trying different things. I was trying to match the area that I was hunting, uh, or and, and matching the time frame because that works for me with other predators. You know, if I go into an area that has a lot of jackrabbits, I use jackrabbit in distress. That tends to work because they've heard that sound before. You know, so he had those sounds prior to going to that high pitch 
bunny sound in the same spot? Um, not necessarily the same stand, but within the same like you know drainage, uh, drainage or complex. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And again, I think it goes to show the the behavior of bears. How I mean, they can just be so reactionary to situations. It's it's far different from calling in an elk or rattling a deer. It's it's so so not textbook from one drainage to the next, one state to the next. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, kind of one of those things you just got to kind of throw the book at them, and, you know, see what happens. So, do I have a Fox Pro that has 200 sounds on it? And, you know, I prefer mouth calling myself. And that same, uh, the the uh, baby cottontail you were talking about, John, that little higher pitch, you can really, seems to work a little better. Uh, multiple sounds on there, you just you never know what's going to work on a given drainage. Are, are you allowed to use electronic call in uh, in Cali? Not for bears. I don't think so. I pretty much I can't do so. anything. I was just saying, can you do anything in California besides buy a tag? With a stick. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's getting there, man. It's uh, unfortunately it's cold, and we have such an, a great reason. Northern California we'll specify that. Yeah. No, don't. In California, you have a ton of call. So if you're going to come here in the fall and try to call a bear in, make a, your mouth call. Yeah. Huh. See, I can't mouth call very long. Yeah. It, it, it gives me a headache too quick. I, I just, it drives me nuts. Yeah, me too. I, I just get too, uh, especially where you want to hit that high pitch. But that's a good point in, in states, and I'll do that a lot when I set up with an electronic call. Once I get that bear, you know, within 40, 50 yards, then, then I'm usually going to uh, go into the handheld call just because I have a little more control over the over the sounds and see mm-hmm. what the bear is doing so I can make a call just like Perry said. That's a good point. See, I, I like the electronic call just with, like the same reason why I like it for other predators, especially when bow hunting. Um, maybe I can kind of draw a little deal here. So, okay, so this is me on the on the ridge, and let's say this is the the bear. I don't know if you could see that or not, but I like to set the call like twenty yards down and like fifteen twenty yards past me over here so that the they have to come past me broadside to get the shot and i kind of made my bones uh killing coyotes that way and i've kind of used that same technique for i mean calling anything i call mule deer that way i call elk that way uh you know obviously one of the places where i can use a fox pro um that's like one of honestly it's like aside from my bow and my backpack and maybe my boots. <laughs> it's probably my favorite tool there ever yeah. was invented was a Fox Pro. I use that yeah, thing yeah. for everything. So, and you know, you can go a step further. You know, like like you said, and what Perry said earlier, the fawns are going to be hitting the ground pretty soon here. But you can get a fawn decoy out there. Oh yeah, here with that. And that works good. Even you know some calf elk uh, or cow elk decoys as well. There's some good decoys out there now. Yeah, for sure. I've done that. I've done that before. Um, yeah. So, well, cool. Um, we already kind of covered, you know, call call for 30, 45 minutes, call straight, um, especially if you're blind calling. Um, you know, if you're if you've seen him, obviously you can, you know, you just keep calling until he gets there or till he turns around and goes the other way. Um, you know, I, I can't think of anything else as far as like you know, method other than like sit in water or, or and that's basically like sitting bait. It's just an ambush to a place where, you know, they're going to show up eventually. Um, have either of you done any like traditional tree stand hunting on them where you're, you know, on a travel corridor or, or something like that, that, that you've had any real success with? I, I am not. Um, the, the, the first episode, um, that I shot for a TV show is called game chasers, mm-hmm. uh, years ago on the, 
I think no, it was called Adventures Abroad. It was before Game Chasers, and uh, and and my cameraman were set up on a trail, and he was he was an awesome guy, but never hunted. And uh, we we were just watching, you know, some trails down in front of us, and here comes a bear, totally from a direction he should not have come from. Right. I mean, right, right up to us, and I, and I have my bow, and we just had sticks stuck in the ground because the bear was going to come out here, and the shot, you know, if they pass this trail, getting from point A to point B, you know, be 15, 20 yards shot well this giant bear comes out and to this day is the biggest bear i've ever biggest black bear i've ever seen wow. and uh it was just an absolute crusher of a bear and uh he ended up getting uh, four yards from us and i couldn't get a shot at him because we were ready to shoot i was wanting to shoot here and he was coming at us from the side well the cameraman was behind me and and i mean oh, the bear was right if it wanted to jump you know it could have and and it was it was it was you know it was just we we're right in the trail basically like you say so um and it, oh my gosh i still close my eyes and that thing was just just giant i've killed some really big bears over the years but this one was was magnificent but it you know that that was just one of those things we tried for the next gosh five six days you know to try to kill that thing and i was in there daylight to dark uh, every day and we never we never saw him you know again or another bear and uh, you know th these things, especially as you get, you know, w w there's a in our area, it, you, you can really do well capitalizing. You know, uh, some on the deer fawns dropping, but but especially the elk calves when they start dropping, um, you know, you you have that that's going to start happening here this last week or so of May. You know, these elk, the cow elk are a herd animal this time of year, so they're dropping multiple calves. The you know bears are killing the calves, are getting the afterbirth, whatever it is. Oh, so, so you yeah, have the that afterbirth. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. Bears kill a, a ton of calf elk. People don't realize what a what a huge impact they have on, on elk population. So you have that in in combination with with boars that are moving. These boars will move 20, 25 miles a day, um, right starting right about now as they're starting to cover ground to to find receptive sows. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have coming on too. So you have different food sources. You have the rut coming on, and, and you know you uh, you have bears that are traveling and, and being more aggressive and all these things kind of create like you said you know uh, more natural scenarios or what's going on out in the woods where you can actually have a really good shot of killing a bear without him even knowing you're around you know type of thing right okay cool well that's all i got for you guys you guys yeah, uh any... really, yeah i'm really what? good on the bears for uh you know this like scott said this time with the calves and the and the fawns if you have a season <laughs> right which we do we have out here in arizona um i know colorado's got a season um i'm not really sure where who else has that i know idaho, idaho does and then goes there, idaho goes all the way it starts now and goes all the way to the end of june or july or something like mid, mid july right yeah, yeah. Some of their wilderness hunts go go through July, which, like Perry said earlier, some of those places are still under a couple of feet of snow. So yeah, bears are gonna they're they're gonna be lean bears, but they should have some nice pelts when they come out of the hole. Right. You know, you know one what? other thing that coming out of the hole that it just reminded me, I had did a podcast. Geez, probably like I don't know, nine years ago, eight years ago, with a guy, and he told me. That on those spring bear hunts, he and I, I think he was uh, I forgot where he was hunting mostly, mostly in Canada, I believe, but or Montana, maybe it was Montana. Anyway, um, I digress. He uh, he um, basically looked for a lot of grass because when they first came out of the hole that first week of emergence, they're looking for grass so they can pass the plug that they. Uh, you know, I guess they ingest a bunch of stuff to plug up their bowels so that there won't be like crapping themselves while they're hibernating, <laughs> so to speak. You know, that's the that's the unscientific way of putting it. But yeah, yeah. Well, and it's interesting. Bears a lot of times eat black bears, especially when they're denning. A lot of times, um, you know, they'll stir around during the winter and they'll get up and and go out and relieve themselves and come back in. And it's nothing to find a black bear den with. I mean, piles of scat all around it, and, and you know, more temperate climates. Um, you know, some of the some of the bigger area, you know, bigger country, and I've seen it with grizzly and brown bears up in Alaska when we lived up there. You know, they're, they're 
their den is through six, eight feet of snow and then, you know, down into the tundra. So, you know, those bears are out and move around. But yeah, it's a grass is usually one of the foods, first food sources they hit. So that's obviously a great one to target. Yeah. All right, boys. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, that's all I got for you, unless it's uh, some other tidbit that we didn't cover that you you want to throw to the listeners. I think we're good. We could go on. No, side, just, you know? just uh, that's a whole other topic. What was that, Perry? Um, we couldn't hear you. Cut yeah, out. Just, uh, get, out, get out here to California and uh, help us uh, shorten up the uh, population of these bears. We uh, we really have a problem, and uh, it's it's really a an easy uh, option to to uh, hunt bears and be successful out here. You said it, it, does it open August first? You said. No, no, it's like the whenever it opens with the general bow season for deer as well. So you can come out here and hunt black tailed deer and bears at the same time. Okay. Uh, but it opens in the third week of August. Third week of August. Okay. So yeah, that becomes a problem because I'm hunting. Uh... No. I'm on elk. <laughs> I really don't care about bear. Right, no. <laughs> if it was right, August first, well. if it was August first, I would have taken my wife, and we would have went to Napa, and then we would have come and went bear hunting and broke come your chops, Barry. Come visit Oregon August first. Right. Fall season August first, and it's there's some phenomenal hunting in early August. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I was going to give it a crack this year. I actually put it on my calendar that I was going to do because it opens here in, in Arizona sometime that first week of August, um, I believe. I got to double check. Um, so don't, anybody listening to this, don't uh, take that you know, uh, verbatim. But um, yeah, I was kind of thinking about putting some time in the beginning of August here and doing some. But yeah, Oregon sounds better because I know it would be cooler. Over here, it sucks. I mean <laughs> – it's really they move they move that first like half an hour forty five minutes and they move that last half an hour forty five minutes because it's just so dang hot. At least that was my experience when I was hunting them more often. I know some guys out here that um, I got a couple friends actually that just they just slay. He's like a bear hunting machine. Um, but uh, yeah, um, Oregon sounds fun, man. I might have to. I'm, I'm actually coming out. Um, to do some elk hunting in uh, late okay. late September, uh, I might be hang, uh, hanging out with uh, Corey Ford and uh, Shannon Mobs um, with Angry Spike Productions. They're uh, they might show me around a little bit, and uh, I want to get a Roosevelt because I've uh, I've been hunting for Rosies twice, and uh, I didn't get one either one either time. So I'm kind of so Roosevelt's and Blacktail kind of got my number. Something about the uh, Pacific Northwest doesn't like John Stallone. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah. you'll, uh, the antler growth is off the hook already this year. Oh, that's awesome. Good. Good deal. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, Perry, I'll talk to you all the time. Um like to have you guys back on i want to have you on scott for blacktail uh for sure because i and everybody i've ever talked to said that uh when it comes to coastal blacktail that uh other than perry that you you're the man so i'd like to I'd like to pick your brain on that right. so. no, that'd be fun. and in the meantime if uh anyone uh of course my website is out there and i have some things there my books are there but our show the hunt is actually uh picked up on netflix now we have an idaho bear hunt there uh where we take a bear over bait and um and we actually take them pretty early in the show and then we show people how to uh skin field dress butcher the whole thing right there oh, nice awesome needed these things then my wife actually does some cooking with that bear later in the show so also we're looking at the food source and yeah it's on on netflix and yeah something to enjoy excellent what, what's your website it's just my name scotthaugen.com s-c-o-t-t-h-a-u-g-e-n.com awesome and i'll put that in the show notes guys so you'll be able to click on it and uh, go right from the show notes to his website and uh perry where can our listeners find out more about you yeah, don't don't forget www.justforhunting.com, all text. 
and uh, just get on there. Uh, you can email us, phone us, whatever you need to, but everything you need to get out here and do that, uh, that, that spot and stock bear hunt is, uh, is there for you to look at. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot guys. And, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. See you, Scott.